She was five foot two and had hands like a logger. You hear the stories about hunting a cougar in the middle of the night and how it had two toes in the trap and how her son Lori was killed and that the person that killed him ended up getting eaten by a cougar and the buttons of that guy's coat fell out of the belly when she skinned it open. It's these sort of things that you, you can't really make up that tend to live on for a long time in people's imaginations. And I think it's ultimately what this story does to somebody's imagination. I think that's what makes it a bit infectious. I'm Peter McCulley. That's Katrina Kodoski who has been bringing the story of BC's Cougar Annie to life in her one-woman show. We'll talk about the show, the story of Cougar Annie, and Kodoski's musical career when Today in BC continues. Hey, it's the Moj, Bob Marjanovic. Join me on the Moj on Sports podcast on Black Press Media at todayinbc.com. Listen into conversations with well-known athletes and celebrities as we look behind the scenes at these successful people. Listen in to the Moj on Sports podcast on todayinbc.com. You'll also find the Moj on Sports podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, YouTube, and Google Podcasts, as well as mojonsports.com. Thanks for joining us today, Katrina. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You grew up in Fort McMurray and won a singing contest when you were only nine years of age, which is amazing. I'm assuming your family was musical? Yes, my dad played guitar and banjo, and my grandma, from the time I was in a high chair, would be playing accordion to us, first in the high chair and then sitting on the kitchen floor for years and years. And she also played fiddle and piano and anything, really. She was so musical. And my great-grandfather studied at the conservatory in Vienna and Juilliard as a fiddler and then eventually became a barn fiddler after he settled land in Alberta. Wow. So how did you come to compete in a singing contest at only age nine? It was actually the Rotary Music Festival. I had a music teacher who would not only in those days transpose sheet music for the accompanist by hand, but like worked with me over lunch and after school and just basically gave me classical music training as a little kid, and she would enter me into the Royal Conservatory music competitions, and then one year I won the whole province category for my age, the highest mark, and then the mayor gave me a scholarship to keep studying music. Nice. Yeah, it was a real deep honor. So have you always wanted to make music a career? I don't know that I always wanted to make music a career, but I started to lean on music really heavily as a teenager, just getting through life and discovering that the world is hard and you need an artistic outlet to deal with things, or at least I did. So more a way of coping with the world. At one point, I think after high school, I decided that I wanted to try and record music and have a go at it. You studied different musical styles vocally and instruments. Tell us about those. So the classical music for voice first, and then I got interested in musical theater and did musical theater from the time I was five until after high school, and then took opera training for a number of years while I also studied jazz training and just loved those teachers so much. And yeah, it was really versatile in the styles. And then when I started really getting into songwriting, it was more about just that authentic sort of folk style of singing from the heart, like three chords and the truth. And the instruments you learned? I started with piano. And then when I realized, (laughs) I laugh about this, but I I like playing music at the beach with my friends. So I eventually had to learn guitar. And uh, I didn't really want to learn guitar because guitar is hard. And the first two years learning it, you're just like, this sucks. (laughs) And then after two years, this is great. I struggled to learn guitar, but I love it now. My dad had an old banjo kicking around his place that was collecting dust, so I asked if I could take it home with me, and then had a lot of fun studying that instrument. You wrote your one-woman play Cougar Annie after you and your partner spent a few years caretaking the actual property where Cougar Annie lived on the other side of Vancouver Island. Tell us how that all came to you. Well, it was magical. I was on my first date with that partner at the time. I decided to ask him that if he could go anywhere in the world tomorrow, where would he go? And he's traveled the world. 
And he said he would go to Cougar Annie's garden. And I didn't know what he was saying to me. I was like, what kind of answer is that? I thought you were going to say Egypt or Australia, but no, anywhere in the world, that's where he would go. So I got very curious. And a few dates later, we were looking through Margaret Horsfield's wonderful Cougar Annie's garden book. And I'm a little more deeply intrigued. Then one day, a couple years later, we were living together then, and the phone rang, and it was his cousin telling us that the Cougar Annie caretaker job was opening up, and we should call Peter Buckland right away and figure out how we can get it, because Neil, my partner, had gone up there and worked for Peter when they were building cabins and trails and things, and so they'd become good friends. So when Peter heard Neil wanted the job, he jumped at the chance to have Neil up there again because they were really good friends. Where is it geographically on Vancouver Island? It's 33 miles northwest as the crow flies from Tofino. And so you have to get there by boat or float plane. It's about 25 minutes by float plane. That'll take you to either the beach landing, which means you need to take your boots off and walk in the water with your backpack and whatever. There is a dock that you can land at as long as the logging road holds up. It's about an hour and a half by boat that way and then half hour by logging road. Tell us how Cougar Annie made it to that spot on Vancouver Island. She was in California and then emigrated to Canada. In between being in California, her father fought in the Boer War, so they actually went to South Africa and then went to England and then Winnipeg. And then her father went and studied in Chicago about becoming a veterinary surgeon, and then they relocated to Vancouver And then that's where she met her first husband, and the opportunity came up to settle in Boat Basin. In those days, the Princess Sophia was the boat that took them up there because the coastal steamers would run from Vancouver around the south point of Victoria and then up to Port Alice and back. Some of them were almost like cruise lines in those days, like luxury cruises, and others were just transport cargo ships. So they came up in a cargo ship and had to paddle to shore in a boat with all their livestock. What was appealing about that property for Cougar Annie? There was a book one of the Gibson descendants wrote called Bull in the Woods, and it talks about the interactions of the people who were going to start whale canneries and logging exports because her background and interest was mainly in horticulture and gardening. They honestly thought when they moved there it was going to be the next San Francisco, and that was part of the draw, was that they were on the edge of this new thing, and that's the story that they were all told. So, of course, they go there with expectations, thinking like any day now they're going to build a bridge, they're going to build a road, and we're going to have access to the world outside. As the years went by and the decades went by, and then all the other settlers died off, they were the only ones there still surviving, so it started to look pretty bleak pretty quick. But in the beginning, the bog that they settled in had a lot of opportunity for farming and having a homestead. And so they were encouraged by the Gibson family to be in the bog because you can use the nutrient soil to capitalize on the microclimate. It ended up being a gardener's tapestry and really a dream job for somebody who's very interested in horticulture. So how did the legend of Cougar Annie grow? She was five foot two and had hands like a logger (laughs) and was larger than life. Her great grandsons talk about looking up to her from the time they were really small. And of course, they ended up being a lot taller than her and never stopped looking up to her. I think it starts there. And then anybody who had an interaction with her. I remember this one guy who was working for the BC government on some capacity and he brought his son with him. And they landed in a float plane at the mouth of the harbor because he had heard he could go to that store and have some supplies. She's in her older years now. She came down to the beach with a gun pointed at him. And then she sees a little kid step out of the float plane and she's, oh, come on up. I just made some fresh cookies and some tea. So one second she's pointing a gun at you and the next second she's inviting you for tea and cookies. I think anybody who had an interaction like that talked to a lot of people about it and I think that's where kind of the larger than life thing happens when you hear the stories about hunting a cougar in the middle of the night and how it had two toes in the trap and how her son Lori was killed and that the person that killed him ended up getting eaten by a cougar and the buttons of that guy's coat fell out of the belly when she skinned it open. It's these sort of things that you you can't really make up that (laughs) 
tend to live on for a long time in people's imaginations. And I think it's ultimately what this story does to somebody's imagination. I think that's what makes it a bit infectious. Cougar Annie had four husbands. Almost six. Almost six? <laughs> I would say so, yeah. Four, almost six? How yeah. does that work? Just auditions, you know, you don't get the part. <laughs> okay. You and your partner were caretakers of the property, but you also gave historical tours. So you must have met some very interesting folks who just showed up because they wanted to see where it was that Cougar Annie lived. And actually, the most interesting people that came up were people that had been there before, and they could tell me what things used to look like or where things used to be, particularly the way that the loggers would talk about her as an older woman and being blind and just the writing was on the wall, but she couldn't see it, that she wasn't really able to keep up with 117 acres of coastal rainforest with a five acre clearing where she ran her nursery businesses. Even if she did know it by heart, she had posts with strings that connected her house to the working garden and her house to the goat shed and the chicken coops, and she could feel her way around. It was listening to them in her later years as they reflected on chopping her wood piles or whatever she could get them to do. And she lived on the property for quite some time. Mm -hmm. 1915 to 1983. She actually sold the property to Peter Buckland with the understanding that she was grandfathered in and he would have to hire caretakers to let her live out the rest of her days there. Did you write the show when you were on the property or did that happen later after you moved away? I wrote the songs on the property and like when I still lived there, Royal Roads University and hiking groups and different people would come up in groups and ask me to put on performances for them. So I started getting the premise of the show of connecting the songs with stories in between and we would do kerosene lamp concerts for them up at the hall that's there or at the beach around the fire. It started there, and then after we lost the job there and I was trying to figure out what to do with my life, somebody actually suggested that I make a play and present it as a theater piece. And so I started looking into how to do that and wrote what became the play after the fact, but used the songs that were written on the property when I was there. So for three years, you lived off the grid. Tell us what that was like and what you might have missed the most or (laughs) what you enjoyed the most about being off the grid. I enjoyed that I didn't have to listen to people playing music in their cars really loud. I loved that I didn't have to listen to that. (laughs) What did I miss? We didn't have hot water. Luckily, we had water, but it was cold. And so I missed my bathtub and heated water on the wood stove. And I missed restaurants. I, I became a better cook. I liked getting into the plants, the flowers. She had a lot of really beautiful heirloom flowers there, so really amazing smells. It was really heavenly when they would bloom. I loved that. And actually, the taste of the water up there is so pure, and the air is so clean. Yeah, it was a really special time. I felt really alive. When Today in BC continues, Katrina Kodoski talks about taking her show back out on the road, her new album, and we'll hear a tune as well. Why spend hours searching dealerships, comparing makes and models? Find the best of BC's inventory in one place, todaysdrive.com. You'll have access to inventory across BC, where you can easily find a vehicle that fits your needs and gets you where you need to go in comfort. Get in the driver's seat. Don't miss out on the many options we have available for you. Powered by Black Press Media, todaysdrive.com connects you with exclusive new and used car deals. Today in BC is a Black Press Media podcast. I'm Peter McCulley. Katrina, you've been touring with your one-woman show about Cougar Annie as a play since 2012. You've probably played pretty much every town in British Columbia. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. I've missed a few, but yes, it's been in a few places in Alberta as well. And some relatives of Cougar Annie are in Alberta? Before it was a play, I heard that there was a suitcase full of letters in Winnipeg. And so I set up a month of touring seniors' homes and farmers' markets to fund my drive out to Winnipeg to take a look at the letters and whatever was in this suitcase, which ended up being at least six letters and a dozen photos that are in the show. Yeah, really amazing stories from Cougarani's great-grandson Blair Meadows and Mer Meadows. They were both really instrumental in 
creating the multimedia part of the show that includes the authentic voices from that time. It's been a different show as a result of those forays, you could say. So you stumbled into a treasure trove. I felt like it was, yeah, because I had so many questions. I was living up there for three years. I was telling her story doing this tour where people would come walk around the property and I would talk about her and the place and then I would have work to do as a caretaker looking after the things that we look after, the trails and the gardens and walking on the land she walked on. And I just had so many questions and I still have so many questions, but some of those letters certainly got the curiosity out of the cat, you could say. How do people react from hearing the story of Cougar Annie for the first time in that type of a setting? It goes really deep. I think it it inspires people's imagination in a very unique way. I think ultimately her story is very sad and she endured so much. I think for myself, it helps me through my worst days because I think if Cougar Annie was in this situation, she would have this expression, oh, could be worse and like she had things that were really bad and she'd say oh could be worse can we hear a little bit of cougar annie i'll give you her off the top of the show when she's talking to her caretaker and this is the first bit of dialogue that you'll hear from her in the show if it weren't for these damned old eyes and this frozen shoulder my dear i'd still be fit as a fiddle all these years i've poured my soul into this farm into this post office, no one is coming around this store going to tell me what to do with it. I am not leaving. Your facial expressions change quite a bit during that as well. <laughs> Having a very happy, smiling chat, and Cougar Annie showed up. She was fighting the loggers for her land at that point. Fast forward to the pandemic. Cougar Annie wouldn't have had any problem with the pandemic because she was used to fending for herself, living by herself. But of course, in our society today... And you being a musician have really made making and sharing music a challenge. How did you make it through that time as a musician? Actually, my time at Cougar Annie's prepared me quite well for that type of isolation because it was a very isolated experience living there off the grid for three years. And it gave me some skills. It was super boring, actually, for the most part. I really relied on creative energy and the rush I would get off of songwriting and I'm a pretty big creator. I'm creative in a lot of different environments. So for me, I just took the time to try to record as much as I could because I've got about a thousand songs. And there's a part of me that thinks, gosh, it's like when you know you have to can the apples before they rot. It was a similar kind of feeling. And so I really focused on learning my audio engineering skills and working with a couple of different producers. And so I'm just about to actually release a box set of four albums, one of them from before the pandemic, but the last three I recorded since the pandemic. Okay. I'm intrigued by the fact that you've written a thousand songs or more. Yeah. So what's the process? For instance, Valdi says he's got a couple of boxes at home on the shelf with, you know, posted notes and little scraps of paper in the top of a cigarette box or something. <laughs> yeah. With just one or two words, he says, you pull them out and look at them later and try and put it together. So what's your process? Voice memos on my cell phone is one of the best these days. Oftentimes I'll get a lyric and a melody at the same time. And it usually stems from an overwhelming feeling like that has to come out in some kind of explosive way. So when you sneeze or you laugh or you cry, for me, writing a song has physical experience. Sometimes I just find something beautiful on the instrument that I happen to be playing and create a motif and then figure out what fits with that motif. I'll flip through hundreds and hundreds of notebooks where I've written ideas and poetry and I pretty much write every day, every single day. I want to share what I'm feeling and thinking and so yeah, there's lots to draw upon. Tell me about the album you released a few years ago. After the shipwreck. So my partner, Neil, that I was with at Cougaranis and years before and after, passed away from a heart attack in 2018. I started songwriting, of course, to deal with it. I was playing some of the songs for my friend, Jude, who was out visiting from Nova Scotia. And he said, it's hard for you to play these, but it would be a beautiful record 
And if you want, I'm out here for a bit and I'll help you put it together. That was during the pandemic, but also just before the pandemic, because I was still playing shows out on the East Coast. And so we recorded some of it in Souk, where I live, and some of it in Nova Scotia. And we had musicians from all over Canada contribute. So that was pretty amazing during the pandemic to be getting emails from people in Nova Scotia and wherever they were sending us tracks. Even my friends from Baltimore contributed some vocals. album was After the Shipwreck, and the tune, Moonbeams. Your producer was Jude Pelly from Nova Scotia. I met his dad a couple of times, Derek, when he worked with Figgy Duff and Rollins Cross. Fantastic family of musicians. Tell us about the box set that you're working on. During the pandemic, I was writing a lot and getting into audio engineering and recording. Time disappears really quickly when I start hitting record and editing tracks. You're isolated when you record records anyway, so it doesn't even matter if there's a pandemic or not. You're not able to go and hang out with your friends because you got to get the track. So yeah, three albums later, now coming out of the pandemic, each one of the albums relates to an element. So Dreamtime, which I released in 2016, I recorded that in Baltimore with Scott Smith, is the air element. After the shipwreck is the water element, dealing with grief and the edge dwellers, which it was my band and Souk. We recorded that together. It's very earthy songs, day-to-day life experiences. And then Soul Anthems, which I received a grant from Creative BC. And just at the very end of the recording process with Zach Cohen at the Woodshop Recording Studio. So they're all going to be together on a little USB tiny tin. I actually made my own blend of harvested local herb tea. So you'll have this elemental blend of tea to listen to with your album set. How does the show end with Cougar Annie? So it starts and ends as she's an old woman and it goes into her younger days and then the rest of her life progressively through the 65 minute show. In the end she's old and she just says her final statement about where she's at at that time and what she thinks and feels how she wants to stay on the land. The song ends with 
a song about how she wants to stay there, how she's given her whole life to it, and it doesn't matter that she can't see anymore. She just knows where she belongs, and it's there. I'd like to thank singer-songwriter Katrina Kodoski, who is Cougar Annie, for being with us on this edition of Today in BC. If you have suggestions or comments, send a voice message to podcast at blackpress.ca. You may be part of our podcast mailbag segment. You'll find Today in BC podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, and Google Podcasts.